every day another door closes, but a new one opens again. Whoa, whoa, whoa. every way we travel must end, but there another road begins. Whatever you've seen, haven't you heard? We started off that I've been doing this technique for myself for many, many years. And and it's just so important because of the things you're talking about, you know, that you get into this different space and you learn how to in inhabit this sort of different attitude than you have out in the real world. <laughs> and it's just, uh, I find that it just goes deeper and deeper and it's become more and more exciting to me. And so that's why I wanted to teach this. This lecture, I'm, I'm going to talk about Eros, the fire of life. And uh, last time we we talked about this, you know, that that erotic energy that keeps us alive is everything that we do. I mean, every living person is motivated by eros, and the culture wants to squeeze that down into sex because it can control that. And in fact, you know, on on one side we have the Puritan attitude that anytime you have fun, especially with your body, that's questionable. And then on the other side, you have this pornographic attitude that the advertising world gives us, that, that there's no sacred cows. And so if you feel something, it's because you're hungry and all you need is our product. You know, and so for the, for the greater culture, squeezing us down to this really thin view of Eros is what serves their purposes. And it does not serve the purpose of the human being who has a body. So what we're trying to do is open up that space to include the whole erotic universe, which we have no language for. We don't have any familiarity with it. So last week, I couldn't find a model anywhere. Uh, Leah jumped up and said she would do it. And unlike expectations, you know, she didn't just throw off all of her clothes, which wouldn't have presented us with anything. I mean, it would have been great for the class. But, you know, she she posed partially clothed, which brings up another really interesting point about this format. And incidentally, I told her I was going to talk to her about it, and, and I said, I, I won't do it. And, and she said, no, no, go ahead. So she knows me. I'm doing this. But, what it does for her, as an artist, is it presents her um, a kind of conflict. So she poses with some of her clothes on in a, in a context where we're just assuming the model is nude. So it gives her an opportunity to go through the reasons why she did that. And let's say, let's say she has you know, a handful of perfectly legitimate reasons. You know, oh, I didn't tell my husband ahead of time. You know, I promised myself this. I would have to explain this new tattoo on my belly that says, oh, all you people suck. You know, whatever. <laughs> whatever, they're perfectly legitimate reasons. But for her, she gets to go through and enumerate those for herself. And for the rest of us, it doesn't make any difference. But that same process of being exposed to the issues is what, is what this technique is about. I talked about the, the concept of a relationship as a bridge. So here's the artist, here's the model. They are independent until they establish a kind of connection. And then there's this energy that flows between the two. So you have one on one side of the shore, the other on the other side of the shore, and it creates this Face, the third thing, which is like a wild animal, it's full of energy. And that's the energy that we're working with. A person's ego is formed out of the process of separation. So in alchemy, the first item of business is to separate. And that's, for every one of us, that's what forms our ego. You know, the baby is born they look into the mother's eye, and that's the first time that they really realize that they are their own human being. 
so that that separation causes this process. At first you see yourself in the other by being separate from them. So the mother looks, or the baby looks at the mother, re recognizes that the mother is something else, and that's what gives the ego reality. And then after that, you begin to see yourself in your own body. And after that, you begin to see your inner world. And so, in dealing with the model, we go through the same process. The separation makes you real, makes the artist real. And then, you look at the model and you begin to recognize things in your own body. And then, there's a illumination of what is inside you. So that's kind of the process in a nutshell of what we're trying to accomplish here. <laughs> oh, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, so I'm, I'm going to take this pretty straightforward process. It's, it's fairly simple. I'm going to start with it simple. And I'm going to complexify it to a great degree today. So I want to encourage you to, again, just listen with your daydreamy brain. brain. Because I'm going to talk about psychological terms and all these different parts of the personality and stuff like that. And you don't really need to know that, but it's just a way of unfolding the science behind this. You know, this is this is real science that all this stuff is happening. It's not just something I dreamed up. <laughs> so we'll complexify it, and then in the end, I'll try to simplify it again so that we can actually use it. So let me start with this drawing. This is, the title of it is, Who Shatters My Gaze Into a Thousand Rays. And the way I experience being in the presence of the model is my gaze hits the model as if they are a prism. And it breaks my gaze into all these different colors. And every one of them is part of my erotic livelihood. So today I'm going to talk about how to differentiate between some of those things. But the point is that all of that stuff is just like the light spectrum is contained in the white light. All of that stuff is contained in my gaze. So that's what this starts with. The whole process is, in very many ways, quite similar, parallel to psychotherapy. So, in psychotherapy, the client hires a therapist, and, and the client exposes themselves to the therapist, and the therapist becomes this intelligent mirror, and mirrors back to the client a certain perspective on on their reality. And then the client can say, oh my gosh, I, I didn't realize that. You know, I've... So they're, they're taking that in into their inner being and they're processing that and creating kind of a, a new avenue for themselves. And so in this process, it's similar in that it's, it's the model that exposes themselves. And as I said before, the, the artist applies their gaze and once you realize, okay, the model is being honest with me, you get that challenge. I'm being honest, what the hell are you doing? You know? And and so that makes the artist expose themselves. And so the the model is being a mirror and the the reflected image goes back to the artist, and it's the artist who is the intelligence. So in the therapist's office, the, the therapist is the intelligent mirror. In, in, the, in this technique, it's the artist who is the intelligent receptor. So the possibilities are very, very similar, even though the, the dynamics are different and uh, this technique is actually a lot cheaper. 
in this bridge model, there's a pressure in between the two components. And as the you know, as the artist, I'm I'm leaning forward toward the toward the model. So this is my erotic force that is attracted outside of you. It's like a light beam, that's your eros. And in the relationship, the eros goes through the other person and into the earth, like gravity. In terms of gravity, it's uniting with the core of the earth. In terms of eros, you're really kind of uniting with the other person. And meanwhile, they have a counteractive force, which is called thanatos. So, here's the bridge, here's the erotic force, who's the artist, here's the model. The erotic force goes this way, this resisting force is called the thanatos, and it's harder, it's a little bit harder to describe, but it's kind of a It's, it's the substance against which you can rely. So your erotic force is going this way, and if, if there's nothing there, you know, you just, as, as the bridge, you're just going to collapse, right? It's the thanatos of the other person that, that makes the bridge strong. And if we switch these roles, then it's the model whose erotic force goes this way, and the thanatic force of the artist goes the other way. So, Eros includes an attraction toward beauty, toward opening up, toward aesthetic desire, toward sexuality, um, surrender. There's a there's hundred things that, that the erotic force represents. The satanic force is things like worrying that we're not good enough, uh, being afraid of being known, being overwhelmed, being subsumed by the other person, or totally losing your identity. And this is, these are all natural forces that are part of our psyche. You know, in, in any relationship, you're always kind of contending with those various forces. So that's, that's what creates the structure of the relationship. And then in between is that third thing, which is like a wild animal that is stalking the room. And it has a bunch of energy, but you, but you, you can't penetrate it. And it's just like, you know, you're drawing and the model is up on the stand and there's a tiger walking around the room. <laughs> and it can come up and lick your face or it can bite your head off. You just don't know. But that that third thing is what is what the creative impulse comes from. So the model disappears and the tiger disappears. You know, you're back to, to journaling. You know, I'm just gonna sketch by myself. The model comes back in the room and all of a sudden there's this third thing there. So that's the the energy we're trying to concentrate on. Every time I come into the presence of a model, I'm aware that I see four layers of, of personality in this person. And this is because I've been working at it for so long. But what I want us to become, become aware of is that you're not just seeing a simple person. So I mentioned before, your persona is the, is the part of you that appears on your Facebook profile and your resume and you know you you go meet somebody in a cafe and you say hey my name is Tim I'm, I'm an artist I live in Helena you know I'm a vegetarian these are all things that are part of my persona but there are these other layers to let me talk about the model first of all underneath the persona which is the the person with all of their very specific characteristics, 
is their unconscious. The total personality includes the ego and the unconscious. That can be split up further into the personal unconscious, which is like the, sh the opposite of the ego. It's personal, but you're not aware of what's going on. And then the collective unconscious, which is like the consciousness that we share as a community. I, I draw it as a pyramid because the persona, as a persona, you are absolutely unique in all of history. There's never been anybody like you. Nobody has all of your characteristics. And as you go down toward the unconscious, and, and particularly the collective unconscious, we fall into certain patterns. For instance, think about your house. I haven't been to your house, but I bet I can describe it pretty well. That you have a room that's full of food and it's got some equipment in it that you can make things. And there's another room that has, you know, a bath, a bath and a toilet. And there's another room with a big bed in it. You know, in the same way we can talk about people as having a certain kind of collective similarity. And so that's what Jung calls the collective unconscious. So that's down here underneath the persona. Underneath that still further is, is this archetype, which is the patterns that we share with the greater collection of humanity, like, for instance, all the people who have ever lived. And down below that is the divine, where everything becomes a one. That's what the, you know, the Buddhists talk about, the place where all is one. So I did a, a painting about this. It's not a great painting, but, but it does kind of demonstrate the difference. So the, the persona is the person who looks at you and has a conversation. Behind that is their collective unconscious, which is it's not looking straight at you, but they are there. So this is like her collective unconscious is really similar to all other women who, for instance, live in the U.S. in our decade. And a little deeper level, she's she's similar to all women around the world that live in developed uh, the developed world in this decade. And a little bit lower, she's perhaps similar to all women in Western culture in the last 200 years. So you see, as you get farther down here, it, you're, you're including a greater and greater spectrum of the, the whole human family. And then at the bottom, I think of, you know, Adam and Eve, the, the representatives of all of humanity. And then underneath that is the divine, which in this painting, the persona, the unconscious, the archetype, which you can think of as the goddess. You know, this is Athena, or Aphrodite, or Demeter. And then this white kind of halo is the divine that's behind it all. So the model comes in the room, and I just naturally see all those things. And some of them are easier to, to recognize than others. So of course it's really easy to see the persona because we we do that every day of our lives, day in, day out. We, we directly interact with the persona. So we're really fine-tuned toward that. And the archetypes, the lower layers, it's harder to intuit, but once you realize that they're there, and once you kind of tune in to that possibility, you begin to see these things emerge that are powerful and don't necessarily belong to this particular person. And my experience is, again, that each one of these is larger. So the farther, the farther back you go, the, the deeper you go on this chart, the bigger the presence. So oftentimes, I'll find myself in the presence of somebody and feel this hugeness. And that's a real indicator to me of where where on this scale 
I'm experiencing the person. So you may not fully totally get that person the first time, right? Or, or do you think you get them like, when a model you haven't seen before steps up there, can you reach all the way down? Can you go, can you go, how far do you understand that person? How far past the first storm do you get? Well, my contention is the stranger the person is, the easier it is to find these deeper layers. And so, um, I find it really valuable to work with somebody I've never seen before and don't know anything about because it allows me that opportunity to look really far down in here. And even if I see their face with their, you know, their eyebrow ring and the little mole and their hairstyle and all that stuff, I, if I don't know anything about them, I project all the meaning into it. And so immediately I'm down below the persona. I'm working, I'm filling up this person with all my own unconscious material. And that's to me what's valuable. And I don't mean to say that to, to minimize the, the personality of the person I'm working on, because that is also valuable. But it's a different process. Just like when you go into the therapist's office, you don't sit there and chat with them about their family. And, you know, the, there's this kind of professional barrier that you have to respect in order for the process to work. Mm -hmm. So for you, it's a way to understand your projections? I mean, is it a way that you understand sort of your subconscious more because you're, you're the canvas on which to kind of see your projections? Exactly. Yeah. So, so all of that process is helping to, to illuminate some of these colors. So if you think about the model being these four different layers, and the artist comes into the room with their gaze, they look at the model, and, and each of these layers is illuminated. And that's reflected back, so this is a mirror, it's reflected back to the artist in four layers. And the artist is like this too. <laughs> And so all of a sudden, there's this, this huge number of possibilities of relationships between these different layers. And so on the very first glance, there's 16 possibilities. And then it starts to operate like a hall of mirrors. The model looks at me, and I've had this reaction, and she says, oh my God, you know, what's that about? And that's, that's a reflection of, of something, you know, one, several of these colors going back to her or him. And so it becomes like a hall of mirrors. It's just endless possibility. So the archetypes are a little bit hard to explain, but they, I think of them as patterns that we step into. So it's not a it's not an object and it's not really very uh, delineated. If you think about motherhood, it's a really good archetype. A woman, you know, is surfing through her life and all of a sudden becomes a mother and she says, I don't know what to do, I've never done this before. But it turns out that the things she does are just like the things that every other mother does. And it's because we fall into the archetypes. There are these patterns that exist in the, in the psyche that are beyond us that we just naturally fall into. So I think about, about it like a riverbed. The archetype is a dry riverbed. And, you know, it has a certain shape. And you take your life, your life, eros is the water that pours into the riverbed. And it starts cursing down the the course of this, and, and it, it basically takes these shapes of the archetype. But because you're an individual, you know, sometimes you create a new channel. Um, it's, it's not hard and fast uh, that, that all the, the archetypes follow the, exactly the right pattern. So the the encounter between the artist and the model, the encounter between any two human beings, is an encounter between archetypes. 
And the reason why human relationships are so complex is because all of this stuff is operating all the time. And, and we tend to figure out these, these regimented ways of dealing with that stuff. So, you know, you meet the guy in the garage that is just a son of a bitch and, and he's really hard to work with. You sort of do what you've done in this situation before. So even our, even our patterns of behavior become kind of archetypal. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to point out is our whole lives are built this way so that, that culture is an entire structure made up of certain assumptions and rules and, and patterns and normalities that, that allow us to work well together. And for social lubrication, that's a really important thing. For democracy, you know, we have to learn how to do that. And I don't want to minimize that. But in, as soon as you turn into creative work, you want to lean against all that stuff. Because in the creative world, what you want is a wilderness. You want to be able to, to let go of everything that you have been trained to do your whole life long. So that coming into the studio should be an experience like going into the Bob Marshall. You surrender yourself to the, all the possibilities. And you know that there might be a snowstorm in the middle of June and you're going to get stuck under three feet of snow. And you know there might be a grizzly bear around the corner. So all of these are the possibilities. But in the creative wilderness, you can do anything. You know, everything is available to you. And that's why it is so exciting. This array, this, this spectrum of thousands of colors is kind of like going into the wilderness. You get out of the car and you throw your backpack on and you start walking down the trail and you notice, my God, this, the color of the sky is so beautiful and I'm smelling the wildflowers and I'm hearing the birds and, and here's this beautiful creek. You know, there's just, everything is, is uh, filling your senses with information. I feel like that's what it's like to encounter the model. The model is like the wilderness, and everything that I can feel is available in this person. Now, according to what the culture does, the culture tries to squeeze everything into sex. So Freud, for instance, if you're stimulated by the model, Freud will say, oh, that's, uh, that's because you're sexually repressed. So that's, that's the comment that comes from this squeezing down. It's kind of like if, if I said, I really love the wilderness, and somebody said, oh, you just, you need to bag an elk. You know, the only person, person that goes into the wilderness is somebody who bags an elk. I say, well, yeah, yeah, that'd be fine, but what about the flowers? What about the color of the sky? You know, looking at the mountains in the distance, all of this stuff is available. So we look at the model and we tend to think in these really patterned ways. And if we start to feel excited, especially if it's a contrasexual relationship, the first thing you do is you start to hear Freud, oh, you've got sexually repressed thoughts. And that's, that's one of these beings here, one of these colors. And I say, if that's what you can feel, great, let's go with that. And let's start expanding that and see what's behind there. So I'm off in the wilderness, I think, well, sure enough, I'm out here because I want to find an elk. So my attitude should be, okay, so I'm looking for an elk. What else is there around here? You know, is there something else until the elk comes along that I can give my attention to? So the way to simplify all this stuff, you've got a, a thousand different colors, Going back to this idea of simplifying the relationship is you can always just go by your feeling. So you have two feelings about the model. One is Eros and one is Thanatos. There's an attractive element 
and there's a repulsive element. So what are you feeling? Oh, I'm, I'm feeling more the attractive element. What am I attracted to? Oh, I really like this shape. Okay, you know, let that be the mirror to you and, and try to imagine if this was a dream image, what would you think about that shape? Or you're resisting to something. I find that a lot of people don't like to draw hands, usually because they're so complex and it's hard to make them look like hands. Okay, let's work with that. What is it that is keeping me from concentrating on this part? Why do, why do I leave that out of my drawing? Well, let's use it as a dream image. What is the hand? The hand is its the tool that we use to manipulate the world. It's the appendage we use to reach out to another person. It's, um, it's the way that I count the change. Uh, all the different associations I can think of, when you're doing a dream analysis, you write down all those things, and then you look at the list and one of them will stand out for some reason. That's you know, have an emotional attachment to, to one or two of those items. And they usually have, they're usually on one end or the other of this spectrum of Eros or Thanatos. And so that, that's the process by which you can start to engage the model, look at how you feel about what's happening, and then usually later on uh, try to analyze what that's about. So that's, that's where the artwork comes in really handy for me. I do the artwork. I'm feeling something. I want to dive into the feeling and just do the do the drawing. And later on, I'll come back to the drawing and say, "Oh man, you know this has a certain quality to it." So it's very much like getting the the response of the therapist. You know, I can I become my own intelligent mirror, and I'm I'm beginning to explore my own inner world by. Uh, engaging this relationship. So I would say in the session, just go with whatever you feel. And don't try to judge it. Right. You know, just, just This is in the wilderness. Sure. So you run away from the bear, you dive into the beautiful um, pool, you know, you lay in the sun because it feels good. Just that's all you're going to do. And then later on, after, you know, maybe a day or two later, you can come back to these drawings and say, oh my gosh, look at that. You know, that, that feeling, where is it coming from? Because if you think about it, you're having the feeling, you're in the middle of a drawing, the model is right there, all of a sudden, you know, somebody pulls the fire alarm or she gets a call, um, the model leaves and somebody else comes and sits in exactly the same position, you know, even though it looks like you should be able to just switch one part for another, this whole animal is different. Way to yeah. You know, you're having your arg an argument with your wife in the in the cafe. You go to the bathroom, you come back, and somebody else is sitting there. You're not gonna have the same argument. <laughs> no. One of the hardest things to do is to surrender to the situation. To say. Okay, this is this whole thing is a lot bigger than me, and I'm just going to surrender and be myself and see what happens. There'll be no self. In in the yes, in terms of the ego, yeah, you're letting go of your ego, but yourself, your your right, your person, your right. body is still there. You're still participating. You're still having this relationship, but it's oftentimes really helpful to just get your ego out of the way. Um, try to concentrate on separating the persona from all those deeper layers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Every way we